I always liked the twins. They were fearless men. You know, people have said to me, well, they couldn't have got away with what they did then today, couldn't they? Their name, their sheer reputation, it got that far. And of course, it didn't do us any harm to be around it. No, any, any knife is bad, any knife is bad. But he, like Reggie, was in a frenzy that night. The easy part of it, I suppose, was the murder. And when he turned to me and he was smoking a cigarette, he stood on the floor, stamped on it, and he there I go, trying to be the first man to get a 40 year recommendation. I always found it a bit more relaxing when Reggie was on his own and Roddy weren't there. Because there was then love to have a row and you didn't get involved in their rows. No one did. They were notorious for their rows amongst themselves. But no one said anything. No one interfered. In all clubs you get an occasional drunk, you know, and sometimes they have to be slung out and that's why there's dormer and that, but um, I suppose it's like club land all over the world, really. It's just the same as... I don't suppose it can be that bad, because people wouldn't go to them, really, would they? I don't like that word, gangster, none of us do. It's too flasher, a word. The chaps is more the word we use, the chaps. It was a group of men who got together regularly, and if it was a problem, we was all involved in it. That's what the firm meant. Freedom comes first for me now. Freedom, not the money, the mouth. You can enjoy it, but don't mouth. But you can't buy your freedom, which I learned. I learned that the hard way. bombed out a couple of times and we moved over to Hamlin Street where the post office tower is now and uh, they got bombed out of there. I always remember uh, when I was a kid walking on Tottenham Court Road where the big store is, what was it called now, the big uh, furniture store there, Marples or Maples and uh, I remember seeing a crater in the middle of the road of a bus just tilting over the edge of it. Well, the house, I, uh, uh, the house that I was, the flat that I was brought up, we moved here in 1949, me and my mum, dad, my brothers. And um, this is where I was brought up, Belford House. Just on the, Queen, on the Queen's Road, just off the Hackney Road, bordered with Bethnal Green. But there's your house, and look at it today, uh, it's an incredible thing. But it brings back a lot of fond memories for me here now. The last time I came here, it was in that flat, as I came out of prison, in 1981, my dad died, and the last meeting me and my brothers had together, as a photograph on it, was in this flat. And we've never been together for five or since. No ironic that is. Just to, I just realised it. Unbelievable. Never realised it. Brings a chair to my eye, that does. Brings a chair to my eye. When I was a kid growing up in the East End, you sorted your problems out on a Saturday night. All the men went out for a drink in the pub. The women went out, and if you had an argument or an, an upset with someone, you had a fight outside. That was that was entertainment for the kids. That's how it was. Hence, you have so many well-known boxers and fights come out of the East End and, that, and South London, and the poor parts of them areas. Even the copper then, you know, they walked the beat, and if you did something, you got to kick up the arse. You know, and a smack round the ear old. And I remember that it's it was them and us type of thing. You know, families and brothers. And there were some tough kids. I don't think you got that calibre of man about today who was brought up like that. I mean, things have changed, obviously. When I was in my teens, me and my brother Jimmy, we had a little firm of us. And we used to go different dance halls and that. You had what they call off the record now. They don't have it no more. And uh, you got sued and booed and you went out on a Saturday night. Uh, and you went out and looked for a row, you know. It was all like neighbourhood things then. Like we'd have a row with them out of Clerkenwell or we'd have a row with them out of North London. And, and it stemmed from all that. Uh, but yeah, you know, I had my little 
caused me a little bit of trouble here and there. The Dockers, the Smithfield boys and all the market men, but they're big men, Billings guy, all the fish market. They're big men, I mean, they were strong, you know, the entertainment, boxing was love then. I mean, boxing was what it's all about. I mean, then days you could fill White City Stadium up, but people wanted to see a fight in that. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we were brought up around a lot of boxing clubs then. Every kid, you know, like Envy Cooper and people like that, you know, they, they were our idols. So the fight game was always there. And uh, we all boxed, every one of us, in one way or another. And, um, but I thought it was, it, it was good training. It was, if you had a fight at school, the teacher would come along, give you a pair of gloves, he'd put you in, 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 in the, uh, the hall and sort it out. The best man got up. But that's what it was about. And, uh, and, uh, and also, there were large families then. If you notice, throughout crime, it's all families of brothers. And that's important to remember that. Singly, you don't tend to make it that way. So I think your destiny is more or less set. You know, uh, my brothers, we, um, me and Chris, went down the criminal road. Nicky and Jimmy and, and uh, Liam did to it, only, but never got really involved like we did. But we've always had that around us. That's, uh, my brothers are known as fighting boys. Be one of us, you take the fivers, and that's how it was. I always liked the twins. Uh, that was always good to me. You see them in the East End, around the road, down Bethel Green Road. Very loyal to Bethel Green. Very loyal in their own area. If you all notice some in their lives, they're very loyal to them. I think I like that side of them. You know, we could have gone anywhere we wanted, but mostly in the East End. But no, their, their, their reputation well preceded them. And uh, they'd take anyone on. I mean, and being young men, all of us, who didn't know about them, you went to the local dance halls, everyone knew the craze, you know, as fighting men. So and it, it built up around that. But no, uh, they made a big impression on me. <laughs> when I left school, uh, I left school, I went to work for two pound each and a week down the road, a bedding company. I remember the Sleepy, Belly, Sleepy Valley Bedding Company for Weymouth Terrace. And uh, I thought, this ain't for me. So within a couple of years, I was going getting jobs in the city and that, and nicking the loads. When I was a kid, I used to work mostly around here, get a job, van driver. Never no intention of delivering the goods. Nick the load, doing the dodgy light the table. I mean, in them days, you could get away with it. There used to be an arcade there, an amusement arcade. And we used to go out there on a Saturday night. And uh, I used to say, you only give us a few quid, you know, get a bit of trouble in there, and you'd do anything. Ten or whatever, you know? And I started to do it in the cafe, old loose, I remember it. And uh, if we went in there, about six, six, seven handed, the punters wouldn't come in because we'd be in there playing, so give you a fight to keep out of there. Like the local dance halls. I remember it's the berries. They had one in North London and one down in Mayor Street. And uh, we used to go up there, they didn't want us in there. And uh, he said, look, it's a fiver. A fiver was a fiver then. Go and have a drink somewhere, you know what I mean? So it became a way of life. Easy money, you know? Young kids, I mean, an average wage then was about five or six quid. So I wasn't doing very bad, I, you, you, you know? And when it starts to get like that, it, it becomes a habit, you know? In the actual fact, it, 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 it was racketeering in a small way. Well, we were going to nick the wages out of there. And, uh, unbeknownst to us, he locked it in the safe. So we got hold of him, tried to get him to open it. And, uh, it probably had a couple of IDs. And first of all, they failed to pick me out. But the second time he fingered me. And uh, there was a couple of others involved in it, but you take it on your chin, don't you? And I went down with it. Um, and uh, I got out of on the appeal. So, but I was guilty, yeah. I've always been guilty. Don't like to admit that. But you, you, you've got to look back on it and say, well, I did that. We all moan about it and complain about it. That's part of prison life. Easy money. Easy money without doing a lot to get it. You know, um, not great prizes. Good little prizes. Good lumps of money. Always there. 
didn't have to do a lot for it. It becomes a way of life. Crime becomes a way of life. And, uh, the, you know, you get nicked. Occupational hazard now and again. It doesn't deter you. Because you come out, you do it again. Uh, so you go down that road, and, 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 and while you can do it, ain't a problem. But you know, sooner or later, ain't gonna go on forever. It's hard to find out. Yeah, 18 months for thieving, for conspiracy to rob and steal. And we, we nicked a car. We didn't actually get the car away. And of course, I got out on the appeal. And uh, I got 80 months. And uh, anyway, I went to the appeal courts and walked out of it. Got acquitted. Then in 1965, I got three years for conspiracy, uh, to, uh, conspiracy, conspiracy to rob. Prison life, it, it brutalises you. It brutalises you. Prison was different then to what it is now. They gave bread and water out. You know, it, 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 I'm not saying prisons are soft, far be the case, locking up's bad enough, but prison was different then, you know. And uh, I come out of it, very anti-authority. You educate yourself in prison in a way that a lot of people wouldn't want to be educated. But if you got it, it's like going to college or university, you know. That's a nice way, but the colleges we went to and universities were totally different. No schools for crime. So you start to graduate up through it all. And I came out of the 18 months. I was, I was free for about two years. Uh, and then I got nicked again. You know, probably could have been nicked many times before that. Um, and got the three and came out of it. And I thought, well, I'm having, I'm having no more of that. No more robberies and that. I want to go out the heavy game now. There's other ways of making a living. And that's when I start to use the background and the reputation of the underworld. That was where the Crows lived. But obviously not here now, it's gone, the old house is gone now. <coughs> but how many times have I walked down here to this little house? You remember, it's all little terrace houses here then, not, nothing like it is now. Um, and the, the old bridge there. Many times people said that the, the, the Crows are going to be attacked at Port Valence. A little room is one of that, little, uh, little bits to add to it all. And uh, they're a load of rubbish, you know. The crazy are going to be shot from the railway arch up here. And, uh, but they're very loyal to this area. I mean, funny thing, as just before they moved out here, they built this block of flats here. And um, so if you look at some of the film, the old footage of the craze, you'll see this block of flats here. There's a lot, little bit of film of Reggie polishing his car just there. You've got to remember this is the, of, of a weekend, but it's very quiet. You walk around here, you smell the dinners being cooked. Just every time I look there, I keep thinking of that house being there. And also, when they got a quick in the McGowan place in 1965, you see the three Cray brothers all shaking hands together, a very really big picture on them. And that's where it was taken just there. And that was the equipment when the Cray's got free. So there's quite a lot of history around, around the Cray's around this side. That's what I'm talking about. It was inevitable that we were going to come together. My brother ran with another firm. And uh, in the early 60s then, I mean, when the Crows were really getting their power, there wasn't anyone they didn't know. And, and I'm being logic about it, it, it was in our interest to be around them. Because as I said to you earlier on, we were running about the country, people were using their names unofficially, and it, they, they used to get the ump about it. I mean, in a way, the Crows got blamed for a lot of things they never did. You've got to understand that. And I got blamed for a lot of things I did do. But it, it gave us a license to use their backup. That's what it did do. And you've got to take advantage of that situation. As long as you put them in the frame with you, you know. It, they were uncanny in a lot of ways. There's not a lot around they didn't know what was going on, they did. They had a very good system of finding out things, you know. And so it was in our interest, like, uh, there was a lot of affiliation with all, all, all the boys throughout London. Um, 
So it, it, it was bound to happen. I think they created a scene of fear and that. I think that was, it, they could do it. You knew it, you felt, you felt their presence, you know. They weren't the best of conversationists. They weren't the best, that you, they, didn't, they hadn't, didn't have a lot of humour, you know, especially in the line they was in. Uh, but they, they, they gave out this aura. In all clubs you get an occasional drunk, you know, and sometimes they have to be slung out, and that's why there's doormen and that, but um, I suppose it's like club land all over the world, really. It's just the same as... I don't suppose it can be that bad, because people wouldn't go to them, really, would they? People talk about protection money and all the rest of it. It was never... You know, it's not, not, a word, not a nice word to use. Have you got, it was under cost, in other words. But what it was put down is a pension. It was always put down... The nickname was a pension. So and so's getting a pension out of there, so I'll leave it out. You know, that's that's uh, that, that, that was a nickname for it. It's under the cosh. And uh, so and so's get or whatever's getting the pension out of it. The twins get their pension here or whatever. But um, this is all part of the Cray area, all along here. They're very fond of this area. And extended on to it bordered North London. Uh, isn't it? And, and extend all the way out to Warpstow, so you're talking about a pretty big area. But they're, 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 they're named around here. I mean, that was, that was like a law unto itself. And it could be as many as 200 places, different clubs and that. That's apart from the West End and other things they had going for. They put their name to a place and it, it, it's, it's like a form of insurance. I mean, the difference with the craze was this. They didn't have to be there, which is unusual in the criminal world. Their name was enough. It was a very feared name. Now, today we do it, it's done different. You have, uh, you have doormen and bouncers and security. Um, and to me, it's a very dangerous job. Any man doing that job, it, they didn't have to do that. Their name was enough. And that, I've never seen it since. Never, it would never happen again. I saw the, I saw what it could bring and where the respect it got. You know, and, uh, but I look back on it. And that, I, I regret that side of it. But yeah, I want the piece of it, yeah. Because they, they were virtually untouchable. They tried to nick them, you know, and they got out of it, and it built up from there, and it started to build and build and build. And, uh, but they were what they were. And a lot of people admired them, you know. Two kids out of the East End, no educated men, not the greatest of conversationists, but look at what they did. No one refused the craze, no one refused them. Wasn't in your interest to do it. People just didn't do that. You know, you, you weren't dealing with, uh, with people you couldn't say no to. You know, I'm not talking Godfather here. What I'm saying is that if, if, if they went in, if they was invited in, and let's be fair about it, they didn't go around looking. I want to get taken down the microphone. That it, it came their way, as a matter of course. You know, uh, if you were going to do a bit of business, let's put it this way: most clubs, pubs. Casino gambling, because Dan's not with a hooky anyway. They need the criminal element in there, you know. The criminals are good gamblers. They love a bet. The majority do. The image is how you look and how you dress, uh, as, I, uh, as I always do, with a suit on, a shirt and a tie. Um, and that's the image of it all. Dress was a code. You dressed to a code. You dressed to impress. It's like being, I suppose, like being an actor, going out on the stage or whatever. What they see is what they get. And people want to be impressed. It, it was glamorous in a way, but in later life, it was not to be so glamorous. You know, people only remember that side of it. I don't know the pain and heartache that come out of all this. It, you know, no, which I'll talk about. Uh, I can't call that a glamorous life. I, I, I find it very sad now. Look what it cost me, my parents, everything I ever had. I lost a marriage, my children, my mother and father died when I was in prison. So where's the glamour in that? But, you know, and you look back on it, would it, I often wonder, would it have been any different? Could it have been different? I don't know, I'm not sure about that. I don't think so. I think it was, what happened was, was destiny anyway. <laughs> I 
after the war, there was a lot of guns came in the country from the, from the wars and that. Um, and my mate, he worked for a gunsmith. And uh, he'd, always, he'd make them up and bring them out. So we always had them around us. Uh, anything you wanted, to that extent. And uh, so it wasn't unusual to have a gun. But the thing was, being prepared to use them, that's the difference. And I think, yeah, we were prepared to use them. Um, in for a pound, in for a penny, you know. It's, it's not a game, it's not, it's not a childish game, but it's serious stuff I'm talking about. Um, some of the robbers at that time, some of the bank robbers and the train robbers and all them, you know, it started all come in then. Um, so, but guns were really available, really available then, yeah. See, some people will carry a gun with no chance of ever using it. But some of these men would, would, would be prepared to go with their lamps. They don't talk about it, they do it. You had a row. There were some men who'd take you out. Now today, life don't seem worth a, worth a penny. But then it was a more serious type of business. I mean, it, it got to that state of, of affairs. It got that way. Um, and these were men who, who, who held a grudge. They held a grudge. So yes, you had to be prepared to use yourself, yeah. aloof man. You couldn't look at him in the face, didn't like that. You couldn't stare at him. Go into one. Doesn't mean, you know. Probably get might get a right hand if you done that. you you know how can I put it with Ronnie? You knew instantly what you were doing. When you met Ronnie Cray, he had as I said to you earlier about an aura around him, he had that. And you knew you had to be careful what you said in front of him. Now you could say something to Ronnie one day and the next day take big offence there. I never had a bad word of them, oddly enough, funny thing. Never had a bad word of them. Because I knew how to treat them. And that was the problem. A lot of people didn't know how to treat them. They'd come up to them, like, I'd never see anyone. I didn't know people touching them. Didn't like that. Uh, it was, uh, but he, he never smiled a lot. Always had a look about him. Not deliberate. That was Ronnie, always staring down, always immaculately. I'll picture Ronnie Crane, his glasses on, three piece suit, which was a match, the watch and chain. Right. He's standing in the corner there, sipping a drink. Staring at the floor. Never, said, never really said a lot. Now, Reggie was totally different. Reggie would mix in the company. You know, he was like chalk and cheese. I always found it a bit more relaxing when Reggie was on his own. And Ronnie weren't there because there was then no love to have a row, and you didn't get involved in their rows. No one did. They were notorious for their rows amongst themselves, but no one said anything. No one interfered, and it was just dire death. Uh, but Ronnie was, Ronnie was a man. Ronnie Crow was a man who, if he said he'd do something, he'd do it. No question of that. They had their fingers in many pies, many many pies. You never knew. They kept it all very close to their chests. They, had, that wasn't the one thing, but they had an habit of like, Reggie would say to you, "Oh, he's a nice bloke, but he'd wait for someone to say something different." And then, that's what he did. He, he didn't do, "Lovely man, he's a nice bloke," and he'd wait for someone to say, "Yeah, but," and that was the doubt. That was the doubt. Once the doubt was sunk, you know, it was easy to go to the craze and say to him, "Look." Uh, and I thought that was dangerous. People would go to curry favour with them, tell little tales to them. To, you know, this would keep people in a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. They were fearless men. You know, people have said to me, well, they couldn't have got away with what they did then today, couldn't they? They wouldn't have changed them. They wouldn't have changed them. I think the tragedy would have been if they'd have come out old men that somebody might try to take them down, that would have been a liberty because they couldn't do it at their prime. Now, a lot of people spoke about doing it. And no one did. No one did. So let's not take that away from what they really were. <coughs> if, 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 they, if, if I was to describe the twins, they were gangsters. I think the most dangerous period of them was between 66 and up to on their arrest. They were well capable of doing anything. I 
think they've both gone through bad times in their lives. Reggie getting over his Francis dying. Um, and Ronnie obviously needed treatment. And I think anyone who crossed them the wrong way then, and I'm not talking about a fight or a cutting, I think they'd have gone all the way with them. It got that bad. You felt it. You felt it. It sounded like it was a reckless part of their lives. Jack Lattie wasn't a bad man. He wasn't a grass. He wasn't anything like that. Uh, but as, was, as it was put, he was a fucking nuisance. And that's putting it bluntly. Um, he took them on, he challenged them, and, and, and what I say there is this, that he was told to behave himself by the craze, and I was there when they said it to him. He'd, he'd have a drink, Jack, and that, that was him, a happy-go-lucky man. But when it come to what they said was the murder, I don't think they knew they were going to do him that night. It happened by chance. It was an act, an accident. I'd been out with the craze that night, me and my brother, with two other friends of ours, and we met the craze in their pub, the Carmen's Arms. When we got nicked in 1968, this is where, one of the pubs we were using at that time, where it was theirs, and um, this is where we, but on the night that, 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 that this was Jack the Hat went off, this is where we met, me and my brother, the two others, and the craze and that. It was all here that night, and then we left here and went on to the Reasons Club, where we were supposed to have met Jack the Hat. And, uh, and this is where I left the crazy was that night, and the next time Mr. Sheen was in that flat. So that's uh, it's also known for something else. This is where Ginger Marks was allegedly to be shot outside of uh, disappeared. So it's got reasons. Also, if you look down to my right, there's a church where the crazy things were, all the funerals took place, Charlie, Reggie, Ronnie. If you can hear the background, the kids playing, as, as, as young kids, the crazy went to that school. A bit of local history in this lot. I wonder one day if they'll never preserve this for, for prosperity. Let's just wipe it out and forget all the bowels. You can feel it. I can feel it, smell it. I mean, you've got to remember, something happened earlier that night, in 1967. This has played a big part in my life, wasn't it? Yeah, this little street here. Yeah. If rumoured to be the place where everything happened in gangland at that time. It's still the same, still the same. It started here and it ended here. A little street like this, incredible, isn't it? Yeah. I already know St Matthew's Road. There's a bit of history for you. This is a Regency Club, where after leaving the Carpenter's Arms on that night, where we came and me and my brother met Jack the Hat. Now if you look at it, this is the entrance to it. It's very plush though, very posh. Always had a couple of bags on the doors. If you look to the left there, this would be the rest of them. Charlie's restaurant down, was very nice. To the left here, as you went in, there was a bar, the main bar of it. And the office, the very brother's office, was just the end there. And that's where I was called up from downstairs here. I'm up the stairs here. Tony Barry called me up, a rat. Took me upstairs here, walked in the office, and that's where Reggie Craig was supposed to have given the gun the mop. And then left here for the flat. And that's where it all took place. Um, if the craze had the up here, you were sent in that pub on the corner there, not allowed in here. Which thank God you wasn't, because you wouldn't have got out. There's how many men in here, I've seen some of the Irish men in England walk in these halls, and walk out with their chin broken, their nose broken. You know? So, I mean, it plays a, a very significant part in the, in the craze history. But this was a very, it was different, it was very plush, well done out. Um, a big hang out was all of the underworld in there, but it was, it was a great meeting place, off the manor, you know, all dinner times, great right there. And the building's still there, I think, I think it's haunted by all, you know. There's the old doorway, it's really behind the bar. There's a doorway there behind the bar, and uh, it was all soundproof, and that was our private drinking cup, so if anybody got an item, a bad item, what I would take them out, upset the pump. I'm not, I'm not being amusing there. They've taken out of here, thrown over the alleyway over there. But if you were called in that pub there, you knew it wasn't on you. If you were called in there, and you went downstairs, it's 
remember what, what, what Richard Christ said that night. I was supposed to have said, who's down there? He would have said that he wanted to do it in front of people. So I said, give us a part of it. But this is where, any bad, any bad, probably got bad in this is where it was done and taken over a fire. Bring up some bad, bad vibes here, bad vibes. Well, I didn't know anything was going to happen that night. No one did. My brother was convicted of a murder that he never did. Nothing to do with it, well known. It was doubtful whether I knew. I'd like to think I did, but it justified the sentence. But I can't say I did. Uh, and when we get round there, it, all hell breaks loose. Ronnie Cray never done nothing that night. I was in that room. I was there when they'd done it before. Uh, and even then, he didn't try to, to sweat his way and break through a window in fear. He wouldn't have a row on him. He was quite prepared to do that. And he hit him with a glass and to fuck off. That's exactly, if he had a wind tunnel, I'm convinced that would have been the end of it. But he came back, and that was a mistake. It was a brutal thing that happened. It got out of control. We'd all been drinking. I forgot to add that earlier. I remember we'd all been out that night boozing. And when events started to unfold, any, any knife is bad, any knife is bad, but he, like Reggie was in a frenzy that night. Ronnie Crow said to me, fucking get rid of that tongue. Just like that. Won't even my around, what do you do? You seem to be loyal. You've got to be loyal here, yeah? you know? Other people ran out of that room that night. Uh, as I said, the easy part of it, I suppose, was the murder. It was, was a killing of him. And I'm wrong to call it a murder. I don't like to call it, because I, I honestly don't believe it was a murder. It, it could have been, it was only the fact that the Crows denied it and said it never happened, that it became what it was. But had it been brought out in the right way, it would have been a manslaughter. But anyway, beside the point, get rid of it. Now, what do you do with a body? So we started to clean up the flat. And there was a lot of mess in there. A hell of a lot of mess. We eventually get him into a lighter down a candle wick. Oh, it, was, it was a yellow or pink candle wick bedspread. He was stabbed about three times and he had a big wound in his neck. Got him into the eider down, rolled it over, got the hat put there with him. We managed to get him up the stairs. On, it was like a, like a little uh, a flight of about 12 steps going into the basement. We got him onto the landing, but unbeknown to me, I look up and there's two children looking over the banisters. Now, they, they never saw nothing, I'm, because my intention was to burn the house down. That's what I was going to do. Just petrol it and burn it down because, you, you know, it's far under a train or whatever. That was, that was, the two kids stopped me doing that. And then it was about who was going to drive it away and what we were going to do with it. And we all started arguing. No, not arguing. My brother said, I'm not having it. Ronnie Bender wasn't going to do it. And in the end, I said, fuck it, I'll do it. But you follow me up. Because I had my brother there. And he had something on him, just in case we got to stop. When they got something, because we had to cover ourselves on this, as I said to you. If I, 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 I'll tell you what, what happened. I drove it, we got into the, in the back seat, from we'll going the boot, and it was propped up in the back seat. Now, the off side light of the Zodiac, the headlight is out, not working. The keys, I got out of his pocket. My brother pulled his car around with Ron, and, and we went down Amherst Road onto the, the Narrowway, along Clapton Pond there, along onto the Narrowway. We're talking about roughly about one in the morning, half till one in the morning. Down Mayor Street, I went across Commercial Road and headed for the Rob Wife Tunnel. And I go through the tunnel there. Ironically enough, coming the other way was a police car. Of course, he couldn't turn around, so I put my foot down 
and go out the other side of the tunnel and come round a roundabout, look, there's a roundabout there then, with a church to the right. And I parked the car in there. I lost my brother and mum. I pulled away. I parked outside of a church. I walked back, I had the keys on me. I walked back and my brother and Ron picked me up by the entrance to the tunnel. And then we drove back. We dropped Ronnie Bender down the Hackney Road. And we go back to my father's place in Queen's Road. Not, I don't think we'd realise in, in a way what, what, what had happened. You know, you're doing this in, in, in a state of shock in a way. And unfortunately, I dropped it somewhere where it shouldn't have gone, which was to put Freddie Vaughan in, in the frame. I never knew, I just wanted to get rid of it. I didn't want a body on my hands. As long as it was away from me, I was, happy. I was quite content with that. And unfortunately, it was left somewhere. And when Ronnie Christ said, oh, yeah, where'd you put it? Well, hell broke loose. It's on Freddie Foreman's plot. There's a man in bed with his wife. He doesn't even know what's going on. And wakes up in the morning, or, or was allegedly a body's taken over there. Come on. That ain't on. That's not on with me. So, perhaps it would have been better off being found. Looking back on it now, perhaps it would, Fred couldn't answer it. It was, it was nothing to do with him. It was nothing to do with him. It was just the car was on that petrol. It was an old Zodiac, two to, uh, the old two tone, Mark II. One light wasn't working, and now I am driving a body along at one o'clock in the morning with two people minding me. And you talk about violence. How did I got stopped that night? Whoever stopped me was coming with him. That's how it had to be. I'm sorry I'm being blamed about it. I'm not proud to say that, but it was, I, was on, I was on the line here now. I'm in the thick of it, whether I like it or not. We're all implicated, which was to lay on a grieve me. I remember standing here, standing here, and I threw the keys in there. And to my knowledge, they're still there to this day. That was the only link to me and that the events of that night. That was the only link. But this is what I thought. Running around here as a kid, with all, I mean, it was different then. And yet, one of the biggest tragedies was to have a few hundred yards from where I was brought up. So really, when you think of it, and I've never really put that together. Ironic, ironic, you know. I'm going to map this for prosperity. You know, people don't know about these things here, but that's what it was all about. You still hear that little bit today. You know, part parts of the life. The night of our arrest, this is where we was. And we left here about, about 10, 30, 40, 11. Part of the cars. I went to the Astor Club in the West End. And there the are the more known wrestlers. But this is where that is under observation. And actually, the last photograph of the craze in freedom was taken in that pub. I think in the beginning they would have been happy with the craze. But when they got the lot of us, it was a bonus. It was a bonus. To be honest with it all, they nicked me, they pulled me in twice. So first of all, they got it wrong. They put it to me that I'd, uh, I was asked to do someone a favour. I drove a car away, didn't know what was in it. In other words, it was a hint, look, it wasn't your thing. You want to go against them, here's your chance. But I didn't buy it on that, I won't add in that. They released me, they pulled me in again. Me and my young brother, Nicky, they pulled Chris in, took us down to Tid Tazel House questioned us and he said look he said the next time we come there's no going home no going home and they'd done a raid one morning they nicked a lot of us he took me to Ted Tazel House when I get to Tin Tazel House there's Cater, Frank Cater, Nipper Reed and John DeRose there and Mooney, Henry Mooney this is the investigation and he said to me I'm going to ask you five questions there's your opportunity to tell me what you know. And he asked me five questions. Where was I on such and such a night? When was the last time I saw Jet the Hat or Jet Medvedi alive? Was I asked to, to take him somewhere? Was I asked to drive a car somewhere? 
and the cattle drivers were asleep. And I went, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, right, you'll be taken away, you're going to be charged with murder. I always remember that day because they found us guilty on the Tuesday evening. And he, it was Melvin Stevens and the judge was sort of saying no more about, I'd like to say something, but it's best I don't. Um, they brought us back for sentence the next morning. I always remember they was letting us go out two at a time to the toilet. And me and Ronnie Cray went to the toilet. And all I remember was a principal officer with two screws coming up and saying to him, Ronnie, you want it upstairs? That's exactly what they said. And Ronnie Cray turned to me and he was smoking a cigarette. He stood on the floor, stamped on it. And here we are, I go, I'm telling you the first man to get a 40 year recommendation. And he marched up the stairs. And he went up. And about 10 minutes later, he came down and we was all waiting. It was all in one cell, they put us all together. And he came back in the cell, and he let a fag up. He never said a word. And I think it was Charlie who said to him, oh, what'd you get? He went, only a 30. I said, no, nothing had happened. I was amazed. I was amazed. It, 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 Ian Barry, I can clearly see Ian Barry, who walked in the beggars with Ronnie, and they said he put the bullets in the ceiling. He went like that, he stood in the street, he said, went bang, in the, in the back of the fence, like, only a 30. He said, so nothing happened. Then the next one up was Ian Barry, 20 minimum. Then they brought Reggie up, 30 minimum. Uh, then my brother went up, and as Chris went up, he got a life in 15 minimum. He come down, he was, he said to me, you're next, only 20 minimum for you, and I thought I was going to get. But they kept it in line. And then the last one was Roddy Bender. He got a 20 wreck. Um, then they took Charlie up. They tried to laugh him and Fred off. It was like the judge turned into a frenzy. It's like he lost all control. He was getting a kick out of it. Because I've never seen so much blindness in this trial in all my life. I've never seen nothing like it. I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter. And I didn't... I just feel a bit of injustice somewhere here. I didn't get a fair trial. They wanted them out of the way. By hook or by crook. And it was said to me, by hook or by crook, you're going. I remember getting off the coach in Wandsworth Prison that night. And you know what? In the it never really bothered me. I had things on my side, and I'll tell you how I viewed it. I was the youngest. That was a bonus to me, in my eyes. There was other men, at that time, just getting the train robbers, getting big sentences like, like we got. So that took a little bit of the sting out of it. Uh, my brother's round the corner. Uh, and I don't think it sunk in for about two years. I don't think it really sank in. I really mean that. He just didn't, I've never moaned about it, never complained about it. All in years, I've never, it's just, uh, uh, it's just a non-existent. It does, it, it just doesn't, it, 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 it's just something you get, you get into. You get to live that way of life. After about four or five years, it don't mean nothing no more. It's survival. And you start to survive it. But prison does a funny thing to you. It stains your soul. You never recover from it. Not then, then. So you can you can come out of it, but once you're going to over the twelve year mark, it affects your life. Even to this day, uh, you look around where I live. I don't remember prison by, but I live a prisoner every day. It's what it's what it, it, it's what it makes you. you. You can't escape it. I still have prison habits. I know that. It's the way you're, you, you, you carry yourself when you come out of it. But if it, did it do any good? I think you, re, you, I think you rehabilitate yourself, which is such a word. You certainly don't get it in prisons. You do it yourself time. The whole idea is to keep you time. And as you get older, you slow down a bit. But you can do what you like in them places. But 
they'll do you a time. You ain't getting out of there. And well, I came through it very hard. Nearly didn't. I came out. Things didn't work out in the marriage. It was over. I didn't know that. I came out to a life license. Um, I came out to this reputation of the underworld and all the rest of it. He stood law to what it was all about. Um, and I think, in a funny way, people admired it. I don't think it was an admiration for the craze. I think it was admiration for what I did. I'm going to be honest about it now. Because people will say to me, I wouldn't have done what you did. And I found that a bit freaky, mate. Because I did. But many people say, I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have done that. Did it? Look where you give up. But I don't think that bothered me in that way. I, it, it, it was just something that... Uh, you lived your life that way and that was it. You accepted it as part of the game. But it was... Um, it was to affect my loss of my father. He died when I was in prison. You know, even for our prison lives, it was never easy because of who we all were. It means we've like a fucking animal and they're going to have to live with me. And that's what makes a lot of the boys different. They live by them rules in there as well. It didn't change because we went to prison. It didn't change me. I still did the things I did. Because you, you have to survive it. A lot of people can't survive it. Uh, so I did exactly the same in there. It's what I did outside. Only you were in a different environment. Um, when you're living in them places, you don't know what you're dealing with. You know, I have some very good friends in prisons, but I wouldn't like them living next door to me. That's putting it nicely. But, I mean, I can remember looking down the landing and the lowest sentence was 25 years. You know, it's, there's always someone worse off than you. Um, but I think the, the after a while, you, it, 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 you settle into a way, it's you and them. You know, they give a bit and they take a bit and we take a bit until I get a bit more. And it's a game all the way through it. And the game plays itself out. You know, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it, it's about mind games. But prison, prison's like that. Prison is a mind game. And, uh, but, yeah, the inmates, it's, it's who you are in there. People don't respect, I mean, sex offenders are at the bottom of the rung. You don't even get to get, you don't get near them, they're protected and all the rest of it. And I, I must admit, I've had some of the worst of the worst around me, unfortunately. Uh, from Brady to, to Strathen, you name them, you know. And you become immune to a lot of, a lot of pain that, that people would be shocked at at you. I've seen men top themselves, cut themselves to bits, crack up, you know. So you're living and it, you become very immune to it. I know I am. You know, nothing shocks me no more. You see tragedy around you all the time, but by the same hand, there's a lot of humour in them places. Some of the best comedians I've ever seen should be on the Palladium. I often question, I often answer the question, what the hell are they doing in the nick? You get some very painters, carpenters, comedians, sick, you name it. But, but they're in prison, you know. Um, so you've got the humorous side of it and the very downside of it. But in the end of the day, when you, when you go behind that door, that's when it finds you out, you know. It's all about being a brave face never showing emotion to, the, to, to, to other men. It's a weakness. You know, it's, it's rules that you live by. Um, you know, a man comes out jolly every day of the week. A lot of backstabbing goes on in them places. Like, you know, you can, you can have a high rank woman and be down the floor the next... Someone's always waiting to pull you down. It was all my worst moments, all a bad moment, a lot of it. But I made a humorous life out of it somewhere, I don't know how. I remember getting, I spent, I got 12 months down a control unit uh, for gross, pol gross personal violence to a prison or assaults and all the rest of it. And you don't get, you get to go in front of what they call a board of visitors, the visiting magistrates. A governor is only entitled to take so much, give you so much punishment. If the charge is deemed to be 
of, of such a serious nature, they give it to a board of visitors where they can take big lumps of remission or give you a lengthy spell down the block. And we were going in there and getting 12 months punishment, and I mean punishment, no bed, nothing. But how long can you keep a regime like that? Do you know, I started to thrive on it, I started to enjoy it. Fact, I ain't lying, I've done it. I don't know how, but I learned to sleep 23 hours a day. It's, it's amazing, it's amazing, the sense of survival. And you make a little life for yourself. I never come out of that control unit for 12 months. In the unit, seeing one other con who was down there with me, never see no one. When they opened your door, you had 10 screws outside the door, ready to jump on you, you know. But how long can they keep that up? It has to break down, you know. As I said to you earlier on, we've all got to live together. And I remember going to that control unit Christmas Eve, 1972, when I've just been in front of the board of visitors and got some of the biggest punishment we've ever dished out of prison. And I remember saying to him, yes, your rules now, but you'll live by mine. You're going to have to live with me here. Yeah? You can't do no more to me. And they tried to slip a psychiatrist into me. They tried the chaplain, you know, and it starts to loosen itself. And I come out of that. I came out of it. I don't know how, but I did. You know, and, um, but punishment, it's like a kangaroo court. You've got no charge of guilt before you go in there. Let's be fair about it. But you don't remember the bad side of it. If you ask me what I was doing in 1978 or 75, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. In other words, I blanked out of my mind. I completely blanked out of my mind. You can't live on prison. You can't live on your past like that. It's a part of it you don't want to know about. Because let's be fair about this. We couldn't have been that successful or that glamorous to spend most of our life in the nick. Now, I'm not naive enough not to know that. So I've got to take that into account. So you, I see things a lot more different now than I did then. But I can't remember the bad side of it. I can't. I don't want it. My mind don't want to remember that. Perhaps it does it deliberately. You blank it out. Perhaps I should bottle some of us when we go, you know, for prosperity. And look at a later stage. Perhaps there's something to be said for that. But I, I think you become immune to punishment. Totally let down. It wasn't what I wanted. You, you know, when, it, when you're starting off, it's a blaze of glory, but it's not like that. I was very depressed. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what I was coming out to. In there, I had that security. I knew the people in there. Uh, I knew how to handle it. I lived by the clock, meal times and all that. You tend to live by, unbeknown it, you're institutionalised. And I found it very difficult at first to handle. I think they expect that anyway, because I had to go to, it was a set routine now in Nova Lisha. Uh You went six months open prison, six months prison hostel, to adjust you to the life outside. It's more or less a crash cause and release. But what can they, you know, what does, it, what does it do? Nothing, you know, you come out living in the past. You, you are living in the past. Even now I do that, you know. It's very hard to, you, you've missed a lot. There's a big gap here somewhere, and I can't fill it in, and it's just something I can't fill in. And that's why I find it difficult to talk about the, the, the downside of it. I've seen stabbings, I've seen murder in there. I've seen some bad violence in there. But, you know, some of it's best not spoke about. Some of it's best, because other men still live there this day. You know, and probably go through the same thing. You know, it doesn't change that much. You know, I always swore when I come out, I was never, ever going to go back, even to visit someone. And I broke that rule twice. But once, I went to visit Ronnie a few times in Broadmoor, which is an hospital, and I went to visit Reggie twice in Mason. And I didn't want to be in there. What, I thought, what, what am I doing here? What the hell am I doing here? I'd left it behind. I'd left all that behind. But to remember it in the Pacific, I got jumped by the screws and all that, but I ain't complained about it. It's part and parcel of what it's about. Perhaps I deserved it, perhaps I didn't. 
But I've seen some bad things done to men. There's no going back, and I know that. It's, it, it's, it's over. The legend's there, but it's over. And in a way, I'm glad. And, and people say to me about crime, crime in general. I won't get involved in it again. I wish I had my time again. I wish I knew what I could have achieved. I'm not, I won't glow over it. I'm not, we're not stars. Let's get this right from the off. None of us are stars. We were what we were. Uh, I wouldn't like to think the kids today would follow down our paths because let's get it right here. The craze can't be a role model. They all died in prison. And that's no role model. And I'll tell any kid, I will never ever tell a kid to do wrong. I couldn't do that. Go out of trouble, you lot. Who are you? Go out of trouble. Who are you? Hello. 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 I can look in the mirror. I really can do that. But I can. And there's a difference. And I get a lot of satisfaction out of it. I see people look at some of us sometimes and think, what makes them tick? What makes them tick? Well, I say, don't find out. You don't want to know. You don't want to know. Thank you.